welcome everyone. Um, we start the meeting with our Melly Bell. Sounds a little anemic, um, but you, you get the drill. So my welcome today, I wanted to share with you an email that I got from another club. Let me get that opened up. If you don't realize our club charter was actually, we were actually chartered as a club on September 9th, 1911. So that's yesterday. As of yesterday, our club charter was 109 years ago. So that's pretty amazing. And the email I got was from a Rotarian, Sarin Faruri, who is the past president of Rotary International District 3150 in India. So here is what he wrote to me. Dear President Debbie Beasley, this is Sarin Faruri, past president of, Sakur, of Sakurabad West Rotary, Rotary International District 3150 from India. Your Rotary Club of Denver was chartered on, on December 9th, 1911, which is today. So he sent this to me yesterday. I would like to extend my warm wishes to you and to all your club members on this joyous moment. Rotary is the only organization which has global footprint and is working towards happy communities across the world and its noble initiatives. Thanks to our Rotary Club founder, Rotarian Paul Harris, we are able to make a difference in the communities where we live looking forward to working with your club on service projects. So how about that? Pretty remarkable that our history is that deep and rich and to get that kind of note from across the globe. So with that, I'd like to do, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So a reminder to everyone, make sure your screen's on. If you've got a screen, make sure we can see your face. Wanna see your face, not your chin, not your ceiling. So everybody looks so awesome right now. So thank you for that. With that, I am turning the Baton over to Frank Lawrence for our inspirational moment. Frank is a past Denver Rotary Club Foundation president, and he's a retired security protection service. So Frank. Morning, everybody. What inspires me? Resilience. Native resilience exists in the world of nature, the environment, human spirit, and human social systems. To paraphrase Wikipedia, resilience is the ability to absorb or avoid damage without suffering complete failure. And resilience is the objective of nature and of communities. A resilient structure, system, community, or person resists an extreme event with minimal damage. And after the event, rapidly recovers its functionality, similar to or even better than the pre-event level. I take pleasure imagining historical examples and experiencing current examples of resilience. The earth suffers a meteor strike that destroys the dinosaurs, but does not extinguish life. Life just changes. Humans face a global pandemic and respond in record-breaking speed with vaccines. This great experiment called America resiliently elects its leadership. Today's speaker, Britt, perceived a need and climbs all 58 14ers on her mission to support Shelterbox. Resilience in nature and human existence spawns myriad minor and major adaptations, accommodations, and innovations, and they continue to persevere. Thank you, President Debbie. Thank you, Frank. That's a great word for the day. So thank you so much. All right. 
Troy Szymanski will be giving our club secretary's report. So Troy is our club secretary. He is a partner and fund manager for Outpost Fund. Troy. Thank you very much, President Debbie. All right, we'd like to start by welcoming all of the guests. Again, in the interest of time, we want to get to the program. It should be a great one, uh, but I do want to welcome each and every one of you uh, as a group. Uh, next up, we have some birthdays, and we have a lot. We have Howard, Allison, Elizabeth, Tom, Francisco, Kristen, and myself are all uh, counting a lap around the sun this week. So normally I implore you to uh, to reach out individually, but since I'm in this group, I mean, hey, I'm not going to tell you what you do. Uh, <laughs> do what you'd like. Uh, some announcements. Um, our virtual happy hour will be tonight at 530, but this is probably also uh, one of the last times it'll be on Thursday for a little while. We're going to try a new format. So starting potentially next week and maybe uh, a couple weeks after that, we're going to move it to Wednesdays. So if Thursdays work for you, and it's the only night that works for you, this will be the last evening for a while that a Thursday night happy hour will happen. So that'll happen virtually and uh, over Zoom, and the link will be shared in the meeting recap email later today. Finally, don't forget to register for our annual Rotary Family Holiday Zoom party next Thursday, December 17th, from 11.45 to 1 p.m. 11.45 in the morning, it's 1 p.m. While we won't be meeting in person like we usually do, your meetings and events team has worked very hard to make this an exceptional online party with many fun aspects in store. The Colorado Symphony will perform for us live from the Warwick Hotel, and we will play some holiday trivia with a twist. And with your reservation, you will receive a free holiday goodie bag. You will not want to miss this. This is a party so no rotary business will be conducted, and we hope to see you all online. That is it for me, President Debbie, back to you. All right, thank you for that. Don't forget to make your reservations as Troy said. And now with that, a drum roll. Brian Geis is here to give us a peach sale report and peach royalty update. So Brian is our peach sale co-chair, also automobile broker of Centennial Leasing and Sales. Brian. Well, thanks. I think I'm on. Um, thank you very much. Um, real quickly, see if I can get through, and there's a lot of people to thank. So um, it, of note, the, the January freeze is Palisades just didn't get us down, right? COVID didn't defeat us. Losing our long-term, uh, long-time delivery company didn't stop us. A change in venue didn't cripple us. A late season drought that forced us to prematurely halt sales didn't completely unhinge us. The peach sale by 2020, by all accounts, was a major success after we take into account all the hurdles to clear. Thanks go out to the 2020 Peach Committee and volunteers, Debbie Beasley, David Dickman, Lisa Gallius, Chris Hemingway, Jim Johnston, Don Caney, Thomas Longino, Jeff Mason, Steve Mast, Rich Spahn, Pete Wall, Harry Ellison, and District Governor Bob Kemp, who showed up to see how we did stuff and ended up lifting peaches. Special thanks have to go to Jill Stantuccio, fundraising VP extraordinaire, co-chair Kevin Shalladay, who will actually be taking over next year, even after experiencing this year, Harriet Downer for online ordering and in-person help, and Lauren Mast, who dealt with sometimes daily changes and still got us through this. Uh, of note this year, again, Giles Paulson of Ferris Machinery loaned us the forklift they made that possible to unload thousands of pounds of peaches. And a thanks go out to all of you who bought peaches, sold peaches, or sent a box to a friend or client. So by the numbers, our net total this year was $19,845. That'll be split between the Denver Rotary Club Foundation um, and, and uh, the Rotary Foundation. That that will be split 50-50 between Polio Plus and the annual fund. So to compare for previous years, in 2019, our net was $21,084, so about 6% more. But in 18, our net was 19,331, which was actually 2.5% less than this past year. So all, all accounts, we did, we did great. 
I'm going to list off the top 10 spots for peach sales this year, which represent $15,000 of our total. In number 10, actually tied for 10th place, was Warren Donder and Bob Loudermilk with 15 boxes apiece. Paul Jones, number nine, 17 boxes. Kevin Shalladay came in at eight and 20. Um, Charlie Miller, 720. Don Kenny, 23 boxes. Harry Ellison, 25. Brian Geist, 30 boxes. Jim Wilkins, 39. Craig Mills, 61 boxes. And drum roll, please. This year's royalty goes to Chuck Everill, 86 boxes plus a $300 additional donation on top. He and his neighbors got together, put in, put in an e, a, a newsletter. There we go. There's the crowning. Thank you, Marty. Congratulations, Chuck. He went out this, went after this and went after it early, which helped helped quite a bit. Thanks, Chuck. Really appreciate it. It's important to note that Dorsey and Whitney, through Rot uh, Rotarian Case Collard, typically orders more than 200 boxes of peaches. But due to COVID-19 keeping people from their offices, thus complicating deliveries, Dorsey instead made a contribution of peaches through us and a cash donation through us to the Food Bank of the Rockies. They worked with us in order to make this effective. This highlights how peaches can be used as Craig Mills also does with UBS to benefit both our foundation and clients of Rotarians. Let's do this again next year, make it bigger and better. Back to you, Debbie, thank you. Thank you so much and Chuck, that crown really looks good on you. So it even matches your outfit. That is awesome, very good. Thank you so much. All right, next up is Carter Sales for our Denver Rotary Club Foundation annual meeting. Carter is the Denver Rotary Club Foundation president. He is also broker principal of Carter Sales Commercial Real Estate Services. Carter. There we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. I am now calling to order the annual meeting of the Denver Rotary Club Foundation. The purpose of the annual meeting is to elect new trustees as current trustee terms expire. On December 3rd, Lauren sent out the announcement to the membership to introduce the new trustees to begin six-year terms on July 1st, 2021. And the nominees all have remarkable qualifications to the club, which were evaluated by the trustee nominating committee. The nominees are, Mark Donovan, retired paralegal. Kevin Shelledy, real estate broker, Thrive Real Estate. John Stewart, attorney. Marlene Wilkins, our own Mrs. Rotary, who is the widow of our beloved Mr. Rotary, Grant Wilkins. And Jim White, retired CEO, Denver Machine Shop to fulfill the remaining term of a trustee vacancy from now until June 30, 2023. These nominees have an impressive list of combined designations, including but not limited to DRCF Fellow, Silver Fellow, and Gold Fellow, DRCF Major Donor, DRCF Legacy Society, Paul Harris Fellows, one, three, and six, the Rotary Foundation Major Donor and Bequest Society. And they have, get this, a combined 92 years of membership demonstrating service above self to Club 31. So they're all very qualified. So now the members of the DRCF Foundation are entitled to one vote each. Foundation members are classified as any current active member of the Rotary Club of Denver who has contributed $1,000 or more to the foundation or is committed to contribute $100 or more per year until $1,000 has been reached. Because there is one nominee for each new trustee position, this slate of nominees will be elected pursuant to a Zoom visual vote. I'm now calling for a motion for the election of these five members to the DRCF Board of Trustees as presented. So moved. 
Second. So I have a second. Second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion of this of this motion? So the way the vote will take place, if there are any DRCF members opposed to this slate of nominees, please raise your hand and keep it raised for a moment so Lauren can view the participant screens. We're good, Carter. I'm sorry, say again, Lauren. We are good. We're good. So the motion carries. Congratulations and welcome to these nominees to the foundation board. I am now adjourning this annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Carter. On the heels of that, I am calling to, to order the annual meeting of our Denver Rotary Club. This meeting is to elect our board of directors. We have four Rotarians who've been nominated to serve on the Rotary Club of Denver Board of Directors for a three-year term beginning July 1st, 2021. Among the four nominated, they also have an impressive resume. We have past club presidents, VPs of service teams, Denver Rotary Club Foundation major donors, Rotary Foundation Paul Harris Fellows at various levels. We also have Rotary Foundation members, um, Paul Harris Fellow plus one, plus three. Uh, we have communications team members. And so I'm very excited to announce the slate of Lisa Gullius, land specialist with Belour Enterprises. RJ Ross, who is a retired president of Samaritan Institute. Gary Schrank, who's a retired executive director of Science of Mind Foundation and Mark Whipper, Director of Major Gifts, Regis University. Directors whose terms expire are Lucius Ashby, Nancy Austin, Bob Kapelke, and Will Snyder. I'd like to thank them for their service on the board the prior three years. No additional nominations for board of directors from the membership at large were presented and filed with the club's executive director. As such, when there is only one nominee for each directorship, this slate of nominees may be elected pursuant to a voice vote. I'd like to call for a motion for the election of these four members to the board of directors as presented. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. second. Thank you. Any discussion? Much like Carter asked us to do, if you are opposed with our Zoom format, raise your hand and keep it up for a moment for Lauren to record for us to follow up. It's approved, Debbie. Thank you. The motion is carried. So I'd like to congratulate Lisa, RJ, Gary, and Mark, and welcome you to the board. Our thanks to John Finnegan, Bill Emmett, Peg Johnston, Michelle Maldonado, and Seth Patterson for serving on this year's board nominating committee. With that, I will adjourn the annual meeting for our club. All right, thank you very much. Next is Harriet Downer, who will do our good news buckets. Harriet is a Denver Rotary Club Foundation trustee and also president and owner of Logical Connections. Harriet. Thank you, President Debbie, and welcome everyone to the month of December. So the purpose of the Good News Red Bucket is for you to share your news, your announcements, your updates for your fellow Rotarians and our guests today. We ask for a minimum contribution of $20 you can make the donation at the link that I just posted to the chat. And Lauren will include that same link in the after meeting summary. If you've got good news to share, and just a reminder, this for the re remainder of this first half of the fiscal year, donations are going to the Denver Rotary Club Foundation, DRCF. And next year they'll go to TRF, to the Rotary Foundation. 
Uh, if you've got good news to share, raise your hand physically, or you can raise your hand virtually by clicking on the raise hand capability under participants. And Lauren, Debbie, and I will cruise through the screen and look for raised hands. But before we do that, I want to express appreciation for all Denver Rotarians for your generosity on Colorado Gives Day. We had more participants than one other Colorado Gives Day, but more importantly, we had more money donated than any other Colorado Gives Day that we've participated. So five years, we're getting there. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that, I will look for other hands. So raise your hand if you've got good news to share. Jim Wilshire, go ahead and unmute yourself. And Jim, we need you to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. Yes, um, we are blessed for this time being. And uh, we have our daughter uh, who's from North Carolina uh, has come out uh, by car with her um, large dog, Maisie. There's a little bit of a pressure with us this morning, but anyway, uh, she's with us. Uh, we also have uh, my son and his wife uh, from Germany. Uh, they um, have had actually uh, some time uh, to get over here and they've all arrived. They also, we had some concerns about uh, the coronavirus and uh, the everybody getting together thing. And I was thinking, gee, we'll all look funny in helmets. But uh, anyway, they have been declared and taken their tests uh, and they're non-affected at this point. So. That's been a nice thing here. We feel like we can all get together and enjoy each other. So, and not worry about the coronavirus uh, monster. Um, that's it for us. And uh, I'm delighted to uh, contribute uh, uh, to uh, the pot, so. Jim, thank you very much. And do we have any other raised hands? Uh, an amount of, I'm sorry, I didn't say anything about uh, what I should uh, put in there. And I have uh, looked at $200 to do that. Oh, Jim, thank you very much for your generosity. All right. That's terrific. And did I hear Jill, Jill? Johnston? Jill Santuccio. Jill Santuccio, go right ahead and unmute yourself. I'm giving my $20 today in honor of Marty Everell, who was such an amazing <laughs> co-conspirator, Chuck. You have no idea. I reached out to her. I asked her if she would be willing to uh, be part of your surprise. She went uh, after her dentist appointment the other day and got the peach crown from the rotary office and she and I have been furious, furiously texting back and forth and I was like, ready, go. So thanks, thanks to Marty for helping us get you crowned and thank you for all of your hard work selling 80 plus boxes of peaches to your friends and neighbors. Yes, thank you very much. Terrific, thank you. We should be. And anyone else with good news? So Chuck, Everall, I'll call on you. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Sit right here. I have to say that I did not do the peach sale by myself, and I wanted to say how much fun we had, but I had help from Bob Palmer, who helps me every year and is a former member of our club, and I had help uh, delivering from my wife and my daughter. I also had help in selling from my daughter and... Uh, a uh, niece here in town and Taylor Sherberg, who's a 2030 uh, family. So I had lots of people willing and we do all of our peach sales in our neighborhood. So it's, it's easy if you get a lot of help. So I just want to put in $50 and say, thank you for my friends who helped. The crown is worth more than the $50. <laughs> and it looks just peachy on you, Chuck. Uh -huh. All right, any other hands? Uh, Chad, Tyler? Chad, go ahead, unmute yourself.
Chad, we're not hearing you. Sorry about that. Uh, Sorry about that. This is actually not good news, but I think I should pay 20 bucks for it. I told some of my fellow Rotarians that my email was hacked. So if you get an email from me uh, asking about an RFP, please ignore it and don't open it. So just want to give everybody a heads up. Thank you, Chad, and we're sorry for that. <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dom Lewis, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, I had the opportunity yesterday to participate in a Zoom call with um, 13 fellow Ball Corp Corporation retirees that uh, some of whom I've not visited with for many years since retiring. And it was truly a wonderful experience to share and uh, with these uh, people that uh, helped build uh, the metal container operation of Ball Corporation and some other operations of Ball. And uh, it, it was just wonderful to see these people still in good health, still vital, and still making a difference in their communities wherever they lived around the United States. So I'm going to celebrate that time that I had with those people. Perfect, thank you, Don. And I thank you for that, Harriet. We're gonna to move to the program introduction, if I might. Thank Go you. Go right ahead, President Debbie. I would like to introduce our meetings and events, Vice President Rick Luthold. Rick is the chairman of Sanderson Stewart to do our program introduction. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, President Debbie. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Brittany Woodrum. She goes by Bert. Uh, many of you saw informational clips in the newspapers this year with regard to her accomplishment of climbing all 58 of Colorado's 14ers. And she did that in an effort to raise money for Shelterbox and their emergency relief fund. Uh, many of you may be aware of Shelterbox. She's going to tell us a little bit more about that organization also, but it's a disaster relief organization started in 2000 by a Rotary Club in England. Uh, Brittany is a Rotary Peace Fellow candidate. She graduated uh, University of Kentucky in 2015 with a uh, degree uh, focus in nonprofit administration in Spanish and is working on a master's in humanitarian assistance. Uh, she, uh, like so many other young people, loves uh, cycling and hiking. She loves studying uh, languages. And this is a new one. I hadn't heard it uh, expressed as a through hiker. I call it extreme hiking. Somebody who climbs mountains and uh, does uh, uh, long distance hikes like the Appalachian Trail and the Camino de Santiago. Uh, she enjoys that kind of activity. Her ultimate goal in life is to be service uh, to, to be of service to uh, all those people around the world, uh, dedicating herself to solving the challenges uh, that uh, exist for people and provide humanitarian assistance. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bert and uh, have her provide her program with regard to that exceptional achievement of climbing all 58 of our 14ers. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rick and Debbie, for the introduction. And thank you all for having me here today. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Yes. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so Rick did a great job of introducing me. My name is Brittany. A lot of people call me Bert. Out on the trail, you often adopt different types of names. We call them trail names. So that one happens to be mine, but I really respond to just about anything. Um, and this summer I took on quite the monumental challenge of climbing all 58 of Colorado's 14ers to raise money for Shelterbox, which as Rick said, is an international disaster relief organization uh, that was started um, by a Rotary Club in England about 20 years ago 
uh, just as like a small Rotary Club project. And over the past two decades, it has transformed and grown into this international powerhouse in terms of providing emergency disaster relief for individuals and communities who have lost everything as a result of natural disaster, war, or conflict. Um, so they respond all over the world, including in the US. And one of the things that I love most about Shelterbox is just the versatility, I guess, of the aid that they're able to provide. So every single disaster is different, which means that every single response is different. And one of the things that Shelterbox does really well is um, before they deploy, they go in and they send in a needs assessment team who really see what beneficiaries need um, in their aid boxes. So while they are a shelter organization and while they're very well known for this tent that you see here, um, they are also able to provide a myriad of other uh, items that um, provide that basic, ne uh, basic necessities for survival. Um, shelter can also look like a number of things from the provision of tarps to a tent um, to even things like tools uh, for individuals and communities to help with that rebuilding process. Um, and one of the things that they were really quick to do at the onset of COVID was to start providing things like water basins and soap, as we now know that just on an individual level, one of the best things that we can do to keep both ourselves and our community safe, safe is keeping up with those basic hygiene practices like washing of hands. Um, so how I found out about Shelterbox and how I got to Colorado and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, as Rick said, I'm originally from Kentucky. I studied, I studied nonprofit administration, um, graduating from the University of Kentucky in 2015. Um, after graduating, I had the great fortune to really kind of jump around from fellowships to programs, working with uh, a variety of NGOs, focusing on everything from education to refugees to women's empowerment. So I've always been very community and service oriented. And one of the places that really, I guess, planted one of the the opportunities I had that really planted the seed to specifically work with humanitarian assistance and refugees was my experience um, living and working in Myanmar. So you can actually see this is a photo of me a few years ago. I look a little different. I'd shaved my head. I was living with um, a bunch of Buddhist nuns and I was helping to start a school for them to teach them basic computer skills and um, English skills so that they could go to pro, um, pursue higher degrees with their masters or PhDs in neighboring countries. Um, and I was there in 2016 and 2017. And if you know anything about Myanmar today, you probably know that it is home to one of the largest humanitarian crises on our planet. Um, and I was living there at the time of um, the biggest and greatest attack on the Rohingya and with the expulsion and genocide of these people into Bangladesh. And it really just struck me that something so atrocious could happen in a country that I was living and staying and I not know a single thing about it. Um, and living and working with these women who truly dedicated their lives to service and um, kind of gave everything to their communities really planted that seed for my wanting to do more. Um, so last year I moved back to the US um, to begin my degree at the University of Denver studying humanitarian assistance. Um, at the same time, I became a Shelterbox ambassador. And two things you learn whenever you become a Shelterbox ambassador. One, it's like an automatic induction into Rotary. So before I became a Shelterbox ambassador, I knew very little about Rotary. Um, but what I learned, I loved because I already felt that I was trying to dedicate my life to service before self. Um, this is also how I found out about the Rotary Peace Fellowship for which I applied this past year. Um, unfortunately, I was not selected, but they did encourage me to apply again. So fingers crossed for next year. Um, but the second thing you learn whenever you become a Shelterbox ambassador is that the other ambassadors are kind of crazy and that it's already in the culture of the organization, which is very, very um, volunteer supported uh, for ambassadors to kind of take on these unique and challenging physical challenges to raise money and awareness um, for disaster relief and for vulnerable populations across the planet. And for me, 
physical challenges are kind of already a thing. So uh, as Rick mentioned, I love hiking. I've done a number of through hikes in my life and um, I'm always looking for unique ways to combine my passion for the outdoors with my love of service. So while I love a great physical challenge, I never wanna take on a challenge just for myself. I'm always looking for ways that I can elevate and support causes that I care about. Um, so whenever I found out that Shelterbox already had this within kind of their culture and their mission, it wasn't so much a question of if I would do a physical challenge with the box, but what it would be and when. Granted, I was in grad school, so I had no time and I did not think I would be taking on any sort of challenge anytime soon until COVID happened. And I think a number of things happened whenever, um, back in March, whenever uh, we, we first really started to see the impact of the virus in the US. One, all of a sudden I had an entirely clear and free summer, which has never happened in my life. Um, and two, being so tapped into the humanitarian assistance world, I really saw this growing need around the world um, with these smaller and vulnerable populations, specifically with refugees and the virus, um, issues that no one seemed to be talking about. It seemed that just because we were in the midst of a pandemic, it didn't man mean that disasters just magically stopped. If anything, they were becoming more critical and more complicated. Um, and the fact that they weren't showing up on our radars or if they were simply as blips posed a real um, challenge for humanitarian assistance organizations and for these populations around the world. If you're being told to shelter in place and a hurricane has just come through your community and wiped away your house, it's a little difficult to do so. You know, if you're a refugee living in close proximity with a number of other individuals having to share a lot of amenities, wait in long lines, live in close proximity with one another, there was a huge concern that if this pandemic and if this disease were to get into some of these camps, it would just run through there like wildfire. And so I thought there's got to be something that I can do that would make a big positive impact while making um, a minimal negative impact on my own community and the smaller communities across Colorado. So I was sitting in my apartment in Denver, kind of looking out at the mountains, and I thought, you know, it seems fitting that I should go out and find some physical mountains to climb as we as this global community are kind of coming together to wrestle with and overcome this very abstract mountain that is COVID-19. And thus, the 14ers project was born. Um, it all came together extremely, extremely quickly. Um, so I think I told Shelterbox about my idea in late April. Um, all of May was dedicated to figuring out the logistics, also just figuring out if we were really going to do this um, and getting the promotional materials together. All of June was dedicated to a lot of physical prep and food prep. So going into this project, like I said, one of my priorities was making a minimal impact. So um, one of the good things about mountain climbing is that most of these are just day hikes. So I thought, you know, I could be pretty much self-sustainable with this project, which was very important to me. So what I did throughout June was I did a lot of food dehydration and food prep. Having been a through hiker, I was pretty used to that. And living just out of my car or out of a tent for a few months is no problem either. So, um, I really did a lot of consideration, I guess, into how I would prep and reduce the impact that I tried to put on these smaller communities across Colorado. Then in July, I finally started the hiking starting on July 10th with Calibra all the way in the southern tip of Colorado and finishing my 58th and final peak on September 26, 78 days later with Crestone Needle. So I had an absolutely incredible journey. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it now um, and also talk a little bit about um, the impact I was able to make with this project. Um, so you guys are from Colorado, so you're pretty familiar with its map. This, these are the 14ers, so they're mountains above 14,000 feet. A lot of people argue if there's 54 or 58. I decided to climb 58 this summer, and you can see that um, they're kind of grouped into these little families. And initially, my plan was very logical. I had a nice little itinerary mapped out, and I thought, oh, I'll just go in a, a nice little loop. But if you have ever tried to plan a hiking trip, you probably know that it's almost impossible to know where you will be 
tomorrow, right? And that so many factors um, come into play whenever you are actually out there with mother nature. So this is what my um, expectation was or what my plan was. And this is about what reality looked like. So um, there was a lot of driving involved. I got to know Colorado better than I know Kentucky this summer. And I had a really fun time. Um, but yeah, I think the logistics of this project were, were very, very, um, very large and um, kind of exceeded what I initially expected. Um, coming from hiking the Appalachian Trail, for example, where all you have to do is get on the trail and follow a white blaze, this was quite a bit more challenging. And also another um, frustrating factor is sometimes you're climbing a mountain and you'll climb to the top and you'll see the, the next mountain that you need to climb, but the trailhead will be on the other side <laughs> of the mountain range. So you have to drive like five hours around that range just to get there. So there are a lot of um, learning curves this summer, but uh, had a really great time. And like I said, I got to know um, some new corners of Colorado, which was amazing. Also, I had never climbed a 14er um, before this summer. So this, there was a lot to learn and a lot to adjust to. Um, so what my daily schedule kind of looked like, I start every day with an alpine start around 3 to 5 a.m. If you guys are hikers, you're probably pretty used to this. Um, one day, I think I even had to start at 1 a.m., um, but fortunately, most of these were just day hikes. So I would hike up, summit around 9 to 11, be back at the car for lunch, pack up my car and drive to the next trailhead, and then set camp and be in bed by what we call hiker midnight, which is about 7 or 8 p.m., and then repeat the whole entire schedule. So um, you guys probably know this, but the uh, hiking season in Colorado is quite narrow. Um, you can pretty much count on July and August being good weather and having clear summits, um, but then September is always a wild card in terms of whether you're going to get snow or not. Um, another thing you have to consider, too, is that the, these months coincide with Colorado's monsoon season. Um, so every single day I could pretty much expect a um, thunderstorm between the hours of 12 and three. And I definitely did not want to be up on uh, the peak above trail, uh, above tree line at that time. So always had to be checking the weather um, and always keeping um, in consideration kind of what the wind speed was and what the weather was gonna be for the day. So what did I carry? Um, I, like I said, most of these were just day hikes, so I didn't have to carry too much. So the box was empty for the most part. I was not carrying any aid, but I did carry snacks, water, and layers. As you can see, almost every single um, season as you're climbing up a 14er, it seems like. Uh, and then I also would carry tokens and banners. So I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a moment, but to kind of raise funds and awareness for this project, um, I was getting donors to sponsor different mountains. And um, one of the perks was that they would send me a, um, a token or a keepsake that I would take to the top. And um, most of those, uh, most of that support did come from different Rotary Clubs across Colorado. And I will say not all tokens weighed the same. So you can see some Rotary Clubs were a little nicer to me than others, um, such as the Rotary Club of Steamboat Springs here, who I, a Rotarian actually went up with me. They sent me a giant car banner while most people just sent me these lovely little, you know, the friendship banners. Um, so the dry weight of the box not, with no gear, just with it strapped to the um, metal frame was about eight pounds, but then with gear, it was about 12 to 14 pounds, which is what I was carrying pretty much every day. Um, however, occasionally I did have to actually hike into a basin uh, where I was carrying my camping gear, my stove, a tent and whatnot. So those were always miserable hikes just because the box is not built to be carried on your back and it does not distribute weight in a very nice way. But we made it and um, bo uh, Boxan, as I came to call the box, uh, somehow survived all 58 mountains. Uh, everyone wants to know which one was the most challenging. So for me, you know, everyone warned me about like Capitol Peak and the Wilson Group. Um, but for me, it was a mountain called Little Bear, which is also uh, at the very southern tip of the Sangre de Cristos. And I actually did this mountain on day two. And like I said, I had never climbed a 14er before this project. And uh, on the like climbing scale of um, 14ers, um, it's about... Uh, 
really all of your standard routes are anywhere from a class one to a class four. Some mountains do get into class fives, but for standard routes, you usually never have to go over a class four. But a class four means that you're gonna be doing some like rock climbing moves. And many people do take extra precautions to actually rope in or um, wear extra gear or take um, like a guide with them on some of these climbs. And I did this on day two. And so um, one of the biggest um, challenges, I guess, of this mountain is that it has this a funnel feature called the hourglass. And there's um, a huge potential for rock fall on this mountain climb. And you can actually see the picture over here to the right. Um, that's, the, that's the hourglass. And if a rock were to fall, it pretty much acts as a funnel where it just comes down, it will fall right on anyone climbing up. So I had a helmet, but one of the biggest um, factors for me was just uh, how that my surface area was basically two times what it normally is and my maneuverability was drastically limited. And so I remember just feeling super nervous on that day. Um, and I kind of, it, it set the bar, I guess. So it, in many ways, it was really great that I did Little Bear as early as I did because one, I think it really solidified what I felt comfortable with and what I didn't. I think if I were to redo this mountain at the time I did it, I probably would have turned around and just said, no, I don't feel comfortable. Um, because throughout this project, safety before summit was kind of a mantra for us. Um, however, at the same time, having made it and accomplished this mountain so early, it really set the bar high in terms of my confidence and what I knew I was capable of. So every mountain after this just seemed a little bit easier. No 14er is easy but I was really glad to kind of have that perspective early on going into it. Um, did weather affect your hike? I mean, apart from the, the monsoons and thunderstorms, uh, as you guys know, we had a lot of fires this summer. Uh, so July, I had great weather and most of August, I had great weather, but towards middle August and the end of August, um, some of the fires, especially around uh, Aspen, did start to affect my climbs. So over here, you can see I'm actually on top of what's called Capitol Peak. And just in the background there, you can see the Grizzly Gulch fire just starting out with the plume. Um, and that was just absolutely wild. That was like the first day of the fire, you can see the plume coming up. And then all the days after that, the smoke just started to spread. And we ended up having to go south a lot sooner um, than we initially thought. Um, and then September hit and we were still on fire. And then overnight, it seemed like we were under snow. So uh, it snowed for five days straight and it just kept snowing. And at that time, I think I had five mountains left and I really thought this was gonna be the end of my project um, because it just kept snowing. And like I said, September is such a wild card. I was worried um, that I would not be able to finish. And I know I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to kind of pass through some of this. Um, but I would just say that um, fortunately, you know, the snow did stop and um, that famous Colorado sun came out and melted all that snow. I was able to finish the project um, and I had such a wonderful community come out and support me throughout. Like I said, I had a lot of Rotary clubs actually physically come out and hike or support me financially. Um, and um, sorry, I'm just gonna pass through these since I know I'm short on time. Um, but in addition, I guess to the physical goal, I did have a monetary goal. So in line with 14ers, my goal was to raise $1,400 per peak. Since all of this came together so quickly, um, I did not, this was not a priority for me. I thought, you know, if, um, I raised $5,000 and I'm able to donate that to Shelterbox, that will be a huge success because I really didn't think in the time we had that I would gain any traction at all. Um, beyond my wildest dreams though, we ended up surpassing my goal. So $1,400 times 58, doing some quick math is about $82,000. Um, and to date we have just, we have raised just short of $85,000. And this project has gained not only statewide, um, media but it has become it has gained national media as well as i've been in i've received reports that i was in newspapers across um europe and across the world so it's been really really incredible donations are still coming in and all of this has been donated to shelter boxes current covid19 emergency release fund 
Um, so what's next? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm currently living in Leadville. So that was one of the greatest parts of this project was just getting to know different corners of Colorado. Now I'm living right in the heart of the mountains working on food access and kind of with the um, Food Bank of the Rockies. I heard someone mention that earlier. So that's another big passion of mine. Um, but I do feel confident that these peaks will not be the last peaks that me and that box see together. Um, so I'm sorry that I had to kind of run through that, but that was essentially my project. I had such a great time and really felt like I was able to take what was a bad situation and turn it into an incredible and impactful project this summer. Um, I'm now going to toss it over to questions. Um, I'm leaving this page up and I'm also going to send this information via the chat. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more or you feel moved to donate, you can visit the project's website um, there at the first link. I also have a blog um, where I post a lot of the media articles and updates on the project via Facebook there. And I've also included my email and phone and I genuinely do invite you all to reach out if you have any further questions um, or just want to say hi. Uh, Zoom is wonderful because I get to present to so many individuals, but it's not always the best platform to connect and communicate one-on-one. -on -one. So please do take note of these. And like I said, I'll send them via the chat, um, but I'll throw it back to maybe Debbie, I guess, to see if I have any, uh, if you guys have any questions, but thank you again. You certainly time. do. How inspirational are you? I am so inspired. I recently retired and my goal is to do as much hiking as I can, but you are truly inspiring to me. <laughs> and I ask people to send me questions in private chat. So I do have a number of questions queued up. This one came early on. Do you hike alone or with others? It looks like it sort of got answered, but go ahead. Yeah, so I went into this project thinking I would hike alone most of the time. Um, and one of the things I did not expect about this project was just the community that would rally behind it. So I had so many friends from different chapters in my life hear about what I was doing and come and join me. Um, but I also had just friends from like that I met via Rotary or people who read about the project or who actually just met me on the mountain and were really impassioned by what I was doing and asked to come out and hike. And I had several people who I did not know at the beginning of the summer join me for 10 or more mountains. So that was super, super cool. That is awesome. Another question, are there shelter box needs in the Caribbean where hurricanes seem to be trashing the islands? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, shelter box has responded in the Caribbean quite a bit um, and including in, the, in Haiti in 2010, that was one of their biggest responses. Uh, currently, however, they focus a lot on the Pacific, South Pacific and we actually uh, just opened an international office in the Philippines as the Philippines tends to be one of the hottest spots for cyclones and hurricanes. Next question, what is the discrepancy between 54 and 58 14ers? Yeah, good question. So um, there is, I, maybe I'll ask you guys, would you consider a peak, two peaks that are very close to each other to be separate peaks if they are not far enough away and the like bridge between them does not dip down so many feet? So a lot of people, the discrepancy, I guess, is how low this bridge between two peaks has to dip down. Some people say like 200 feet, other people say 300 feet, and that's really the discrepancy. Interesting. I say they count. Yeah. Not that I get the final vote. But, <laughs> um, so you've already climbed every mountain. What's next? Fording every stream? Really, though, congratulations. Massive accomplishment and great work. I, uh, I love musicals, so I really appreciate that joke, and I have made it many a times before. Um, like I said, I don't think that this, these will be the final peaks that me and that box see together. We're already talking about a project for 2021. We're talking about maybe the Centennials, which are the 100 tallest peaks in Colorado. Um, but I'm also looking maybe at going over to New Hampshire and to New England and looking at the whites there. Because while um, they're very proud of their 4,000 footers, which are nothing near 14,000 feet, um, their mountains and their trailheads tend to start at sea level. So um, it's about the same amount of elevation gain, although you don't have to worry so much about um, altitude sickness. Well, and we've got a couple offers here that if you do any more in Colorado or maybe even in New Hampshire, that there might be people in this club, Lisa Goulias and myself, who might be in for five to 10 mountains to help you. 
Wonderful. I'll keep you guys posted. <laughs> and I love that you shared your website and your information. That is great. Uh, lots of comments about you know, just commending you on what an inspiration and what an accomplishment. Um, another question. Uh, here's another comment to everyone. What an incredible story. And you did a fantastic job of telling it. You are an inspiration to all of us. Incredible person. Glad that you were doing things with Rotary. Uh, let me see if I've got more. Oh, and then we've got there 583 13ers if you want to do that. <laughs> and then the final question I have, it, it was the person who asked it, there is an understanding that some mountains, do they require on the 14ers a special permit or consideration? I'm remembering that there is. Yes. So um, there are there are two mountains that are on private property. So um, that was one of the reasons I did Calibra first, because my hands were kind of tied in terms of that one. You have to apply for a permit and then go whenever you get that permit. Um, this year, or maybe last year, Maroon Bells in the Maroon Wilderness also started um, requiring permits. And um, if I had had time, I would have told you guys about the experience where I climbed the Maroon Bells together and then went across the lake and climbed Pyramid Peak and had to stay the night atop Pyramid Peak <laughs> because the sun went down. But I don't think that was in my permit. So maybe it's a good thing that we skipped that story. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that off the recording section. Thank you. <laughs> well, I will wrap it up with the final comment that Sid Brooks shared with everyone, which is spot on. You are an inspiration to us. Your courage, grit, de dedication, selflessness, character, and strength are admirable and unique. Thanks for your story. Thank Thanks you all so again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, truly inspirational. One of Rotary's major projects, our major project is to eradicate polio in the world. So in honor of you speaking with us today, we will uh, donate to inoculate 33 children. And with the two to one Melinda Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation match, that means 100 children across the world will be inoculated against polio. So thank you again so very much. Next week's meeting is on Zoom. It's an online party. And so please join us. And Britt, you're welcome to join us too. Let us know. We'd love to have you. So it's our annual Rotary Family Holiday Online Party with a musical performance by the Colorado Symphony. Reservations are required by midnight next Tuesday, December 15th. So please make sure you get your reservations in. And let's conclude the meeting with the Rotary four-way test. So please join me, even though you're all muted, but please join me. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Wonderful program.